Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Climate and Energy Challenge, uh, a joint forum hosted by the University of Chicago in the United States and Peking University in China. Uh, good morning if you're in China. Good evening if you're in the United States. Uh, welcome wherever you are. My name is uh, Luis Betancourt. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Chicago in Ecology and Evolution, and I'm the director of uh, the Mansoura Institute for Urban Innovation Institute here at the University of Chicago, uh, dedicated to studying cities and their challenges, including, as you'll hear today, the challenge of health and the challenge of climate change. So today's uh, panel is uh, dedicated to uh, discussing the impact of climate change on human health. Uh, this is um, uh, this is this is part of this joint forum, and we're excited that you're all here with us uh, today, tonight, and this morning. Um, I have a few housekeeping items before uh, we keep going with the substance of the panel. Uh, uh, to listen to today's program in Mandarin, please uh, click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and select Chinese. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A, the questions and answers button as well function to submit your questions, which we'll get to at the end of the panel uh, in either Chinese or English. And, um, and so with that, I think we're ready to go. So um, health has always been um, uh, has been sort of the personal way, the way in which we, we see many of the challenges uh, of our societies. And in some ways, as we look at climate change, as changes in complete energy systems, and as we change, as we look particularly at urban environments, human health gives us a, a special set of uh, points of view and problems that demand sort of integrated action from which we also we've traditionally and continue to learn from different contexts. So part of the uh, a big objective of our forum is to bring together experts from all over the world, but uh, with a focus on, of course, China and the United States. And that will be sort of the format of the panel uh, also uh, today. Uh, and the idea is that uh, we'll use health as a lens to look at human development. Uh, and then from that perspective, we'll look at various characteristics of urban environments that challenge health, but also under transformation and under innovation can start creating better health outcomes, even under the challenges of climate change. So um, with that, um, I want to uh, I want to sort of start giving you sort of a sense of what we will be doing today. Um, uh, we'll range quite a bit, both geographically and in terms of themes. We'll start with uh, broad issues of human development, as we've seen them over the last few decades, where it has become possible to start quantifying these sort of holistic issues. Then uh, we'll start uh, locating those into sort of the near past of the pandemic, and what some of the changes that occurred and where we are today with the challenges of climate change becoming better defined and more critical. Part of the objective here is that we, uh, we enter a dialogue between our societies and particularly in the US and China, but also we enter a scientific and knowledge-based dialogue towards collaborating to changing these uh, uh, circumstances and help finding solutions to these problems. From that perspective, then, we'll focus on uh, expertise on uh, issues of temperature, longevity, and health, particularly starting with China, but with a global perspective, and then on issues of air quality, uh, both in China and the United States, with an eye towards the transformations that are becoming possible, particularly in the last few decades in China, that have been quite spectacular, but also new instruments and new methods for both studying uh, um, air pollution and its mitigation and also uh, towards um, uh, using new technologies and new forms of science and new collaborations with local communities towards solving these problems. Something that we hope will be models not only useful in our societies today, but into the future glo uh, globally. So with that, I want to start introducing our panelists and the format will be that I'll ask each one of them to introduce themselves and say, uh, describe briefly their work and where they're coming from. And then um, uh, each one of them will have sort of a set of guiding questions that I'll start with. And then uh, after we go through the four panelists, uh, we'll start um, sort of having a panel discussion and then on to your questions. So with that, I want to uh, start with our first uh, distinguished panelist, uh, Dr. Pedro Conceição, who uh, today is the director of the Human Development Report Office at the United Nations Development Program. 
So Peter is a friend of a long time. He has a background in uh, physics and economics, but he's been in the UN system and in international organizations for a number of years with a very distinguished record of service and accomplishments. He is ultimately the person you want to talk to when you think about uh, human development and development in general. He's been associated not only with the measurement of sort of this idea of human development through capabilities approaches, which has a bit of a connection through uh, Martha Nussbaum also to the University of Chicago, but also how that is, uh, how our understanding has progressed, how, what are the factors that influence human development and also through these metrics and their outlook allow us to learn also about what we may do in the future. So with that, I just want to ask Pedro to say a little bit more also about what is human development, uh, how do we use it to think about health, what happened then more focused what happened during the pandemic years what uh, are we now in the post pandemic where are we now to look into the future including the challenge of climate change so pedro it's a great pleasure to have you with us and having you open the panel thank you very much please take it away thank you luis it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you and and the other panelists and i'm looking forward to learning from uh, all of you, uh, including all of you joining us uh, online for, for this webinar. So um, what is human development? Uh, human development is really an invitation to look at how we understand and uh, assess progress uh, and, and evaluate policies, uh, not looking not only at income alone, how well the economy is doing and how much uh, income people earn, recognizing that that is very important, but really by uh, the opportunities that people have to live the, their lives according to what they value and what they have reason to value. Uh, and, and this implies looking at broader aspects of well-being, including health, which is the topic of our webinar today, but also education achievements. Um, but in addition to well-being, to consider also uh, the extent to which people can exercise their agency. Uh, so well-being and agency are the two pillars uh, of, of the human development approach. Uh, now, because we are focusing on health, I, I want to, to emphasize more perhaps what has happened uh, with the Human Development Index, which is a metric uh, of human development that focuses uh, on well-being uh, achievements, combining uh, indicators of standards of living, health, and education. And, and Luis, you mentioned uh, specifically what has happened to the uh, to human development. Uh, and I think the Human Development Index is a good metric, not a comprehensive metric, but a good metric to, to understand what has happened. Now, uh, up to 2019, uh, since 1990, when we started computing uh, uh, the Human Development Index, it was on a steady path of improvement year after year, globally. Um, but uh, since, uh, um, well, over 2020 and 2021, there's been a decline in the Human Development Index globally. Uh, this was driven by uh, uh, recessions and uh, uh, dramatic declines in life expectancy at birth, uh, which is the indicator of health that we include in the Human Development Index. Uh, moreover, this decline was fairly widespread. Just to give you a sense, uh, every year we have one in 10 countries seeing a decline in the Human Development Index, in the National Human Development Index. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, we saw nine out of every 10 countries witness a decline in human development index. So this was a fairly uh, uh, substantial change in the trend of human development and one that was uh, uh, fairly widespread as well, affecting virtually every country uh, in the world. Um, so why, why did this decline happen? Um, so the direct cause, as you hinted in your question, uh, Luis, was, was, was COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, its impact on health and how it affected um, our economies. Um, now, some people may say that, okay, fine, COVID-19 happened, it was a, a tragedy. Uh, but it was like a once in a generation shock and uh, uh, that's unlikely to be repeated. And in any way, it's not connected to climate change, which is the topic of our seminar today. But I believe that we should actually look at COVID-19 
uh, COVID-19 experience that we are still living through uh, as, as, a, as a window into a world that is changing in a very rapid way and in a very fundamental way around all of us. Um, challenges like COVID-19 may be the latest in a series of zoonotic diseases linked in part to pressures on biodiversity. So zoonotic type of, uh, diseases like COVID-19, most likely biodiversity loss, climate change, um, are in a way all manifestations of a broader process of planetary change that is making for a more dangerous world uh, and a world in which um, we may be facing challenges to what happened to health and to our economies as a result to, of COVID-19, not an exception, but something that may happen more and more frequently. So that gives, in my view, a greater sense of urgency for us to understand uh, how, how we can accelerate the transition to more renewable forms of using energy um, and, and has even more reason uh, to invest in, uh, uh, in that transition. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. That's great and uh, the best way possible to get us started. So in some sense, we really are in this time uh, uh, of, in some sense, crisis. But I think a lot of people talk about post-pandemic as an opportunity to look up again, try to look at processes of development and how they've been affected over this critical period and hopefully trying to find new ideas and new solutions as well as common cause, hopefully across also our societies. So uh, the next panelist is, uh, will, will get us there. I was just reading a piece of news today that referred to, it was a piece by UNICEF, so it's, it's in the spirit of Pedro's also service. Uh, and it, it is entitled, uh, the, the, the coolest year of the rest of our lives, in the sense that we expect, of course, the earth to keep on um, uh, warming. This will have many implications for human health as well as for many other things, including ecosystems. So uh, the next speaker is, is Professor Conroy Huang from uh, the Vanke School of Public Health at Tsinghua University. Welcome, Professor Huang. And he's, uh, he's, he's done amazing work in, in many fronts, uh, both in terms of his scientific work, but also in terms of his service uh, with the government in China with the IPCC panel. Uh, he's the lead author of the sixth assessment report, AR6. And in many ways, he's worked both internationally and in the context of China to understand the effects of climate on human health and with an emphasis on changes in temperature, life expectancy, which is what Pedro introduced us to already, and uh, years lost of life, loss of productivity, and many other things. So uh, welcome, Professor Huang. Uh, please tell us a little bit more about yourself and um, tell us a little bit of the context of your work and how you see uh, the challenge of climate change through through this lens. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Luis. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to participate in this panel discussion, the impact of climate change on human health. Yes, uh, I'm from Beijing, China. Uh, I'm currently a professor in the Vancouver School of Public Health at Tsinghua University. Yeah, I have been long engaged in research on the health impact of climate change and the extreme weather events, uh, identification of vulnerable populations or climate sensitive disease and the development of effective public health interventions. Uh, over the past years, our research has provided a key scientific evidence for the necessary response to climate change in China, as well as promoted uh, uh, environmentally friendly development models and a health uh, uh, lifestyle among the public. Uh, yeah, in the context of climate change and sustainable development, my research work is dedicated to uh, strengthening health risk uh, management and uh, promoting uh, plant health. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, uh, outside of my academic uh, career, I serve as the lead author of the uh, sixth assessment report of the IPCC. Yeah, one of one, one, uh, one of the foc one of the areas of focus of your work is really the effect of temperature and temperature changes on health. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, coming from Chicago, we had one of the, in the history of the United States, uh, at any rate, one of the most critical pandemic, uh, sorry, uh, extreme events, uh, a heat wave in, in the 90s, where very vulnerable populations were exposed and with very heightened mortality. So tell us a little bit more, both, you know, where we are with the understanding of this, but also what we may expect uh, looking into the future from your expertise. Okay, thank you, Louis. You are right. Uh, climate change is causing uh, more frequent and more intense heat waves and other extreme weather events. Uh, yeah, 
in not, not only in cities but in other areas. According to the IPCC uh, six assessment report, the likely range of total human induced uh, uh, global surface temperature increase is about uh, 1.1 degree Celsius. Uh, human induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes. Uh, evidence of observed changes in weather extremes, such as uh, heat waves, uh, heavy precipitation, drought, and uh, tropical cyclones, and in particular, their attribution to human influence has strengthened. It is virtually certain that hot extremes, uh, including heat waves, has become more frequent and more free, uh, intense across most uh, land regions, uh, while cold extreme has become less frequent and uh, less severe. Uh, although the Paris Agreement has set goals of limiting the global warming within two degrees Celsius uh, and uh, call on efforts on limiting temperature rise within 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. Global surface temperature will continue to increase until at least the uh, uh, middle century uh, under all emission scenario considered. Even the deep reduction in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas uh, emission occurred in coming decade. Uh, in a 1.5 degree Celsius warming world, most regions at the low latitude will be affected by severe heat events, but the frequency of those events will even double with a uh, 2 degree Celsius warming compared with 1.5 degree warming. As for the affected people, about 15% uh, uh, of world population will be frequently exposed to severe heat events at a uh, 1.5 degree warming, while the number will even triple with a uh, 2 degree warming. Uh, in China, the majority of people now live in middle and low latitude area, which are expected to experience more heat waves. Uh, China, uh, uh, yeah, climate change is uh, recognized uh, as the greatest uh, health challenge of the 21st century. It will threaten all aspects of uh, the society in which we live and our health. The severity of uh, the impact of climate change on human health uh, are increasingly clear and uh, further delay the action will increase uh, the risks. Climate change can affect our human health both directly and indirectly. For example, excess days due to heat waves, uh, like excess mortality uh, in Chicago uh, uh, in, for, in the heat wave period, increase, and also it will increase the transmission of climate sensitive infectious disease and also the societal response to climate change, such as population displacement, displacement and uh, reduced access to health service. Uh, extreme weather events uh, are currently increasingly common in across cities on every continent. Uh, increased uh, exposure to extreme heat from both climate change and uh, urban heat island uh, effect will threaten the health of uh, rapidly growing urban residents. Uh, urban residents now comprise over half of the world population's exposure to dangerously high temperature in dangerous urban health and the development, uh, driving increase in mortality and mobility, and also reductions in labor productivity. Uh, in addition, cities uh, uh, can intensify human-induced warming locally, and uh, further urbanization, together with more frequent hot extremes, will increase the severity of uh, heat waves. Uh, in a recent study, we assessed the heat wave attributed days burden of China uh, in the past four decades. The attributed days to heat waves in China have dramatically increased with the rising trend. Uh, more apparent in recent decades, but some fluctuation among individual years. Increased exposure to heat wave, population growth, and aging are the uh, main reason for the temporal increase and the spatial variation uh, of attributed days in China. Uh, attributed days were mainly constituted in East China urban agglomerations. Uh, for example, North China uh, plains, Yangtze River Delta, which are economically uh, developed and uh, densely populated with high level of urbanization and aging population. Uh, with the rapid uh, urbanization and population migration in China, more people are swarming into uh, big coastal and southern cities. People used to live in cooler northern China. Uh, they may not adapt to hot and wet climate in south of China. Moreover, people from cooler regions are usually not well climated uh, and less likely to use air conditioning uh, which could contribute to greater heat-related mortality and mobility. Uh, yeah, as China's largest emitter of carbon dioxide, uh, China now uh, placed the emphasis on energy conservation and emission reduction aiming to achieve eco-civilization. Uh, recently, China also 
like pay more attention to tackling health risk of climate change. So, uh, especially this year, a Chinese government uh, released the National Climate Change Adaptation Strategy 2035, which calls for building a climate resilient society. Uh, it also calls for uh, protecting the health of people. Thank you, Luis. So it's really striking how particularly heating and heating in human uh, environments where people increasingly live, such as cities, particularly cities that have developed a lot of infrastructure becomes such a critical issue going forward that it won't save everybody, right? In some sense, it will affect us all in different ways. Uh, and also how that combines with aging and other population trends to make the problem even more uh, dramatic. Uh, as you were talking, you know, it's interesting also to see the responses both in China, as you mentioned and described, and the United States with the current administration to try to find increasingly more uh, uh, solutions and interventions to improve these environments, such as with nature-based solutions. We'll get there a little bit later with the question time. So um, another sort of paradigmatic aspect of, um, of, of climate change and energy is related always to air pollution. Air pollution is almost sort of the poster child of what happens to a city as it develops, as it urbanizes, as more people have cars and other machines. And in some sense, it's been very well studied since industrializing cities, but continues to still be a challenge uh, for us today. So our next speaker uh, is, is a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Haidong Khan. He's an associate dean and professor at the School of Public Health in Fudan University. He has also, uh, as, as all the panelists, have done extraordinary service uh, within China and internationally. And he is an expert in air pollution uh, and air quality control, uh, particularly in the Chinese context. So uh, I'll let uh, Professor um, Khan introduce himself and then I'll ask a bit of a question in light of the extraordinary changes in air pollution and air pollution control in China. So Professor uh, Khan, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Luis. Uh, good evening and good morning, and uh, it's my great honor to attend this webinar. Uh, I am Kang Hai Dong from Fudan University, which is located in Shanghai, China. My research background is environmental epidemiology. I study air pollution and uh, people's health, especially in China. Uh, air pollution and health, uh, we, uh, we, I am personally interested in the short-term effects of air pollution in China, long-term health effects of air pollution. I'm also very interested in how to, in how to do intervention study for health effects of air pollution. For example, to use air purifier, to use fish oil to control the adverse health effects of air pollution. So that, that's about me. Thank you, Liz. That's great. So, you know, forgive me, but all of you, all, all of you friends in China, but for, for people in the United States and in the West, we often remember China at the time of the 2008 Olympics and the air quality in Beijing mm -hmm. and other cities, and this being sort of a, a public health uh, critical, critical issue. So that in some sense was not very good, but, but ever since there's been tremendous improvement in air quality in China, dramatic, once this became a main issue, even during the Olympics, it was very interesting to see the measures that were taken that did change air quality then. So, uh, Professor Khan, could you tell us a little bit, uh, you know, that's a very hopeful development that things have improved so much. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that uh, also connects to improvements in health in Chinese cities? Oh, yes. Uh, actually, the source air, uh, actually, the source of air pollution is, you know, the economic is, is always driven by the consumption of fossil fuels. That's true in China. And uh, so about 10 years ago, I think China was facing the worst air quality problem in the world. As you said, uh, during the Beijing Olympics, I mean, although the air quality during the Beijing Olympics was pretty good, but before and after that, I, I, I still remember the bad air quality days in Beijing. But now, you know, after 10 years efforts, uh, the air quality in Chinese cities has improved a lot. For example, in the last year, the PM 2.5 annual level in Beijing was 33 microgram per cubic meter, which is, I think, compared with 10 years ago, it was, I think it was, it decreased more than 60 percentage. So which is a dramatic improvement air quality. Uh, I mean, even in the world, it's, 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 a, it's, it was a miracle. So I think the chat, the Chinese government has done several good things to control air quality. I think the first thing is the 
the, the change of energy structure. Uh, you know, uh, the energy structure, in, energy structure in China, we used too much coal before. So uh, about 10 years ago, our government takes the uh, change of energy structure from coal to relative clean energy source, such as natural gas and oil. That's one thing. Another good thing is uh, the Chinese government has taken several uh, names to control the emission of particular matter, uh, sulfur dioxide and other air pollutants. So that's the reason the air quality in China has increased a lot, has decreased a lot. But even after such a big improvement with air quality in China, air pollution is still a major public health problem in China. And uh, in terms of global bird disease study, air quality nowadays is now the number four risk factor for human mortality in China. Our top three risk factor for health is uh, smoking, hypertension, and uh, an unhealthy diet. And air quality, especially PM2.5, is the number four risk factor. And uh, another problem for China is, although PM2.5 level has decreased a lot, but another problem appeared, that is ozone. And uh, I think just, uh, just like the California cities in the US, ozone, was a, ozone is a problem. Uh, I mean, for, even for some US cities, PM2.5 is very, very low, but ozone is still a problem. So that's the same things happen in China. And uh, in uh, Southern China, especially Shanghai and Guangzhou, ozone is becoming more and more uh, apparent during the summer days. Another thing, uh, another observation from my study is we just uh, observe very clear evidence of health effects of uh, air pollution, even under very low concentration in China, which means that the current air quality standard of China cannot fully protect human population in China. Nowadays, our current air quality standard for PM2.5 is 35 microgram per cubic meter. I mean, compare with the uh, Compared with WHO air quality guideline, which is five microgram per cubic meter for PM2.5, our standard is pretty loose, it's pretty high. So I think in the future, our government should tighten the air quality standard to lower the, the air quality standard to better protect human health in Chinese cities. I will stop here, Luis. Thank you very much, Professor Gan. So it's, it's, it's a hopeful picture that once this problem became sort of important and actionable, there was so much progress. But it's also a problem that continues to be shared by our cities in China and the United States and worldwide also as they develop, as you pointed out, in relation to technological change and, and uh, development. And it's really a challenge for other cities in other parts of the world, such as in South Asia and Africa, that they um, can somehow... Uh, be able to learn from, from China to, to do their improvements even faster. So on that point, another point that's very interesting and very important, particularly with air quality, but all the things that we're talking about, is that there's been a tremendous change in our ability to measure things. Uh, and air pollution in particular has been uh, the focus of a lot of effort all the way from satellites. And we should recognize some of our European colleagues and the European uh, uh, Space Agency for a lot of effort connected to new satellites to measure environmental quality, but also with sensing. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Madeline Depp. She has a fascinating background in urban planning, economics, and mathematics, so my kind of person. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us, uh, Madeline. Would you just say a few words introducing yourself, and then we'll get back to uh, how to measure air uh, quality control and the work you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, as Luis mentioned, I have a PhD in urban planning and I'm uh, working now as a senior researcher on the urban innovation team at Microsoft Research, so based in Seattle, Washington. Um, and a focus of my work is really on sort of designing next generation sensor networks. So uh, working with Project Eclipse, which was a project of the urban innovation team to deploy 115 low cost sensors across the city of Chicago, which have been running since um, July of 2021. Now, part of that work is, you know, making sure that uh, the network functions, that the data are accurate, that they're usable, that, you know, we're analyzing the information that's coming out. Um, and that's sort of a big part of my research agenda. But then there's also sort of a higher level set of questions there, which are, 
um, you know, what does it mean to deploy technologies in public space, right? What does it mean to use novel big data sources and new technologies, you know, in collaboration with cities in shared public spaces where different people have different priorities um, in a way that can lead to success, where we basically define, you know, the success of a sensor network as uh, being credible, meaning, you know, people believe that the data are, are really referring to real signals and actionable. So aligned with advocacy and policy priorities and something that cities can actually use to improve people's health. So you started describing a little bit the work, but uh, I just want to recognize a couple of things because we jump back in. On the one hand, let me allow me a plug in that in, in some sense in Chicago and at the University of Chicago jointly with a national laboratory called Argonne, uh, we've been really the work of others have been pioneers in, in developing networks of sensors that are able to be deployed in urban spaces and be instruments that allow us more local and more uh, real-time uh, 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 sensing of air pollution and other environmental qualities. And uh, Madeline and Microsoft are creating essentially uh, a new generation of sensors that improved on the technology in various respects. She can talk a little bit about that. But also I think it's fair to say, and this is what I'm going to ask you, uh, improved on the way in which we use this data. So I think in China and the US, but I know you're in China, very interested in big data, but the question is, how do you use it? And one thing that you emphasize, Madeline, uh, is that this is really a social technical problem, right? We need to have, on the one hand, the sensors and the database, really how we use it socially in communities and so on. So tell us a, a little bit about these two things. On the one hand, we have a new instrument that allows us to see better, we see new things. And on the other hand, this brings the problem more locally. So it requires different kinds of agents and collaboration. So tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing here in Chicago and I think in Miami, right? Along those lines. Yeah, um, you know, I can just sort of talk a little bit about the first problem anytime you do a sensor network is figuring out where to put the sensors, right? Um, and I think uh, that becomes almost that, I think lets you surface people's priorities. If you say, where do you want to measure air quality? What people will say is, I think there's a problem here. Or, you know, my, like the city will tell you we have, um, uh, so when we decided to deploy in Chicago, the city of Chicago told us, you know, we're electrifying bus route 66. Can you please put some sensors along that bus route? Um, and similarly, you know, communities on the ground told us, hey, we have real concerns about the west side of Chicago. Could you please make sure that some sensors are here? And so very rapidly, it became clear that, you know, um, despite, I think, three decades of literature saying that you needed to, you know, optimize the, the distribution of your sensors to maximize the variation captured, which is important and you do need to um, make sure that you have adequate coverage, but that you also needed to try to use the network to sort of surface all of the information that different policymakers had about what was modifiable, what they could improve in the city, and similarly that communities had about sort of what they could act on. Um, and so we ended up really using that as core to our approach, you know, building in collaboration with the city of Chicago, a sort of citywide network that could look, let them look at different neighborhoods over time, but also zoom in on particular policies. And then um, working with uh, communities across five neighborhoods um, to zoom in on particular places where there were concerns. And I think this is really framed by, by the U.S. context, which is that, you know, the U.S. has reduced fine particulate matter pollution by 70 percent over the last, you know, since the implementation of the Clean Air Act. But the places that have the highest exposures uh, remain the most polluted today, right? And so fundamentally what we're thinking about is what does it mean to produce, you know, complement existing regulatory monitoring with routine monitoring that fosters equity. Um, and I will say, Luis, just one one thing to flag for you is, you know, just in the first month of monitoring, uh, we saw July 4th, right, which is, of course, a big holiday in the United States where people shoot off fireworks. And it turns out uh, that is not equally distributed across the city. The south side of Chicago saw much higher firework pollution than the north side. Uh, by contrast, we also saw wildfire smoke July 20th that spread across the city as a whole. And so what we realized was, if you're going to do targeted messaging, if you're going to tell people, please close your windows, you could geolocate that messaging or you could really reach out to people in more effective ways if you have real time information in the places that are polluted. That's great. So uh, so it's, it's incredible how having a better instrument also begs new questions and also puts, starts giving agency and trust potentially on communities that may not trust the measurement that may come at a more aggregate level. I remember you telling me a little bit that you could measure even things like um, restaurants that fry food, right? 
and, and other things. So in Chicago, for those of you who know, we like our fried chicken. And so that's that's one of the issues that sometimes you see that also in the air quality as well as, of course, industrial uses and others. But this allows us to go after the problem in a different way that's much more targeted, particularly when levels are lower and the problems are more localized and more to do with equity and equality, which is very important. So at this stage, I think we've heard from everybody a little bit and you have a bit of a sense of all the expertise in the room as well as many of the backgrounds. And, and so I'm gonna move on to a couple questions for the panelists. I'll call on them uh, so that we're a little bit organized. But uh, one, one of the things that uh, I want to ask is that I want to start looking a little bit towards solutions and things that we are discussing, but that we have to figure out almost how to do. So I have a question to Pedro and then to, uh, to Conroy which has to do with this idea of nature-based solutions. Uh, and uh, we, we discussed, for example, that uh, there are many ways in which uh, we're trying to improve urban environments to be cooler, to, uh, to be closer to nature, also for issues of mental health and recreation, as well as fundamental health, uh, to be more walkable, uh, and to retain water. And, and so there are many of these solutions that are becoming effectively um, you know more ecological i think they go in the spirit of the idea of ecological civilization in china and nature-based solutions in the us but i wanted to discuss a little bit the potential that uh, you pedro and conrui and the others uh, if you wish uh, when i ask you you could come in and, and also say your piece how can we use them and the thing i'm thinking is that for example in chicago we have one one challenge that the mayor has decided to plant 75,000 new trees. And part of the question, what Madeline's saying is, where do we plant them? Where can do the most good? And is, is that too applied or how do we think about these issues? So I'll start with Pedro. Uh, I know you see a lot of different parts of the world. Maybe you can give us a couple of examples and then on to Conry. Uh, sure, Luis. Well, I think the most important point for, for, for us to emphasize is that this, this idea that sometimes uh, is put forward that uh, development goes against nature uh, and that you have to sacrifice nature to advance development, however you measure it, for instance, for, for cities to grow um, or, or for agri agriculture to expand, you somehow have to pay a price in, in destroying nature, it needs to be rethought. Uh, and, and in fact, the two can come together. And there are many examples of the opportunities that investing in nature, in preserving the integrity of ecosystems, uh, creates um, uh, opportunities for development, economic opportunities. There are many examples. The blue economy, for instance, is something that is now being spoken uh, more and more about, the importance of preserving our oceans, uh, not only for all the ecological functions that they um, they provide, but also because they are can be a source of lively, livelihoods and, and, and economic opportunity. Uh, and you mentioned Chicago in the city where the United Nations is headquartered, New York. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a discussion on how, how can we manage to supply water to the city? Uh, and, and there was uh, an option or two options were put on the table. One was to, to build these massive water treatment facilities that cost at the time in the order of billions of dollars uh, or to um, preserve and protect the, um, the watershed um, uh, 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 on the land uh, upstream from the city. Um, uh, 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 and, and that was less costly and ultimately, it was the, um, the solution that was adopted. And up to this day, it enabled New York City to have uh, one of the, uh, I don't want to put down other cities in the US, but one of the nicest cities, one of the ni uh, nicest waters in the, in the United States. So uh, I think it's more about um, changing the, 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 the narrative and the paradigm. And I would uh, end by saying that uh, we argue that rather than nature-based solutions, it's important, important to have this idea of nature-based human development, because I think it's important to recognize people's agency, that it's not about uh, people versus nature, it's about people and nature working uh, together. And so it's not having this idealized perspective of pristine nature, but it's more about how can we empower people to enable them to um, preserve ecosystems and uh, through that actually create opportunities for them as well. 
Thank you, Pedro. So, uh, Kunri, I was wondering if you can tell us uh, about a few examples or ideas, both either in China or Chinese cities, or even also from your international experience. What, what are good ways in which uh, nature-based solutions are playing a role or that we imagine could play a bigger role in the future? Okay. Uh, actually, people who live in cities are particularly vulnerable to extreme heat. Um, Actually, a number of epidemiological studies have investigated the potential effect modifier of temperature mortality associations. Uh, in particular, some studies uh, have adopted e e ecological study design to assess the community level uh, factors, uh, such as the uh, number of green areas and uh, vegetative covering. Uh, some studies have found that a high level of green space were linked with a decreased uh, effect of heat. An um, interest in nature-based approach for climate change adaptation uh, in cities is growing. Uh, the preferred uh, nature-based solution were planting more trees, making green shade areas, and also rehabilitating riverbanks. Uh, the main expected benefit were good for leisure, reduction in ambient temperature, uh, pure air, and also improvement in public health. Uh, Yes, in China, tree painting is also commonly used to build a shade space in, in urban areas. Seeking shade is one of the main adaptive uh, behaviors that uh, people are taking when they are uh, exposed to, to heat. Um, however, the academic uh, discussion in China on the gov governance and the policy aspect of nature-based approach to urban climate adaptation for addressing the health impact of climate change is still very limited. Uh, so, so. Uh, I think uh, uh, those measures will also uh, come with the trade-offs in terms of cost for implementation, uh, maintenance, and also water use, uh, in which should be evaluated before uh, throughout a green infrastructure project. Uh, it's, it's still uh, uh, unclear uh, what extent nature-based solutions are comparable with the other replacements, uh, uh, like, for example, green infrastructure, uh, gray infrastructure in terms of effectiveness. So China now still promotes uh, like uh, some uh, building design or using air conditioning to protect the health uh, in cities. Right, so we expect of course to have a mixed system going forward, but I think this idea that nature can do a lot, does a lot for us already, but can do more, but also becomes a partner and we have to think about trade-offs more holistically, right? Not just in terms of the cost of the specific function, but for example, we have, uh, uh, a number of, uh, of studies about mental health and even violence being reduced by the presence of green spaces and so on. So there are many things that um, you know we're finding out and have to learn from each other that we're trying to discover. So uh, coming back to, uh, again, Professor Khan and, and, and Madeline, I wanted to come back to this idea of how we think about solutions that interact with, with communities and how we think about these um, health solutions, particularly in urban spaces, but more generally as socio-technical solutions. Again, this idea of data, but also society. I'm very encouraged by some work we've been doing that in some sense, maybe this is me, that makes me think that this is a way to bring science to society and society to science in the sense that by seeing data and measurement through the lens of the experience of people and communities, we are able to formulate, or they are able to formulate better hypotheses that can be tested. We can all figure out a little bit better how things work and even do better politics. So I, I wonder if you could either disabuse me of this or, or think of a good example um, and, and imagine how we could use this more and put it in the hands of more people so that better solutions are also possible. I, I don't know much about how that's being thought in the context of China or international context that you know, Professor Khan, and then uh, we'll go to Madeline. Okay, I will start first. Uh, thanks, Luis, for this wonderful question. I couldn't agree. Their health determinant includes not only the nature environment, uh, including heat wave and air quality, but also social environment, uh, such as the health system and the financial system and the policies. I think uh, you, if I'm going to take an example, I think one example is uh, social example. I, I, I think is 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 the air quality standard in China. I mean, uh, you know, air quality standard in China is a pretty strong, powerful policy tool for the Chinese government to control air quality. Uh, taking back to 10 years ago, uh, the Chinese government just released its new air quality standard, which was certified microgram per cubic meter. 
Although from today's perspective, it is relatively high. I mean, compared with the US standard or WHO standard, but during, I mean, 10 years ago, it was a pretty strong, powerful tool for, to, for the local government to control air quality. And it worked quite well, I mean, to control uh, air quality across different Chinese cities. And we did see big reduction of air quality uh, in different Chinese cities. And uh, from my epidemiology study, I did observe some health promotion, I mean, due to the air quality improvement. So I think that's one example, how the social policy interact with uh, natural environment to uh, promote human health in Chinese cities and stuff here. Thank you. And this is very much as, as Peter started to tell us, but there's, a, of course, a lot more in the spirit of ideas of person based policy and urban planning. So in some sense, particularly having in mind more vulnerable populations, whether they're aging or for other reasons that may be closer to the problem and in some sense be able to give us the most sensitive and maybe fairer assess, assessment of the problem. So you built that into your program from Microsoft, Madeline. Uh, in terms of creating grants and collaborations that would fund communities to actively work with you, right? So you told us a little bit about it, but I want you to tell us more about how di how difficult was that? And what's the potential that you see for that model or a new model that you think you imagine developing in the future? And you can be your full self as urban planner here. Uh, tell us a bit how it went and what you're hopeful for. Yeah, so in, in the Chicago project, we uh, worked with a local nonprofit to make mini grants to um, local community organizations. And as part of that, we worked with them to figure out where to put sensors um, and then also to analyze and share data um, and report back out. And, and we also worked with, you know, the local Department of Public Health. And so um, that's part of I mean, that's like a general part of increasingly how I do research is to try to work with people most affected by the problem throughout the process of doing research, uh, not just in hypothesis generation, though I do find that's a really effective point, um, but actually through the process of data analysis and interpretation, like research, hypothesis generation, research design, data analysis, interpretation. In all of these places, I found, you know, I bring back a result to a government official and they'll say that I don't know what to make of that. And I'll say, okay, I need to invent a new metric. Um, and so I think, Luis, to your, your point about sort of science to society as a way to actually, like, I think it is a way to do better science. And I think it is also a way to build, um, literacy in the in the community, which is critical if you want to actually advocate. And I will say, Luis, this strikes me as a very beautiful question. I think it's very much grounded in John Dewey and these classic Chicago frameworks. Um, the idea just being that, you know, it's not the case. You cannot do science and just expect it to work in, in a policy context in the United States. I know that's not true everywhere. Um, but that said, I, I do think the most beautiful policy that we've had on, on air quality is the Clean Air Act. And so really making sure that policies are anchored in science and science is anchored in, in people's and residents' priorities, hopefully builds capacity to do better work going forward. So thank you, Madeline. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, another UChicago plug-in. But as you know, John Dewey is with faculty and, and also a uh, well-known pragmatist philosopher almost 100 years ago, and also the founder of the, the school where a lot of the kids, my kids, go to here at the University of Chicago in, in terms of a different approach to education. But the main idea that Madeline's referring to is really, she said it already, but I'll say it in my own words, is that there's no, there should be no separation between science and society. In some sense, they're part of the same process. But we've, 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 most of us were educated to separate them more, and now we're asked to putting it back together in a virtuous cycle of improvement. And I think all the problems that we're discussing today in terms of health, in terms of sustainable development, and in terms of massive changes to our energy systems really force us to think about how to do that. And I hope that the lens here allows us to imagine what that looks like as a process. So I think that that's, that's very good. So the thing I want to ask for each one of you, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to call you in, in turn. And then before I do that, I want to remind everyone in the audience that I would like to have some questions. So this is your chance. Uh, get us some questions on the Q&A box, and then we'll get them um, in just about a few minutes. But one question I'd like to ask each one of the panelists is to look a little bit into the future and particularly, uh, you know, uh, we, we already heard particularly from Conroy how, how critical 
the climate crisis is and the fact that we have very low carbon budgets. And uh, the more we continue to emit, the worse uh, climate extremes will be. And so in some sense, uh, the main problem is often with societies that have not yet developed the energy systems and the levels of wealth that we have. Uh, certainly uh, we've achieved in the United States, but also in China now. So how do we look at uh, Asia, other parts of Asia, other parts of Africa, and imagine the development that in some sense leapfrogs the art mistakes that we all made, but allows us to create something that's more sustainable faster within one generation, which is more or less the UN mandate and the substance of international agreements. So the person to ask that question is of course, Pedro, who's also an expert in Africa. How, you know, is, is it imaginable that we can somehow use all these ideas in a different way to start with and don't have to go through a transition of fossil fuels and pollution and then mitigation? Uh, and then I'd like to pose that question. You can answer it whichever way you think is relevant from the point of view of your work. So Pedro, please go first. Thank you, Luis. So I think, first of all, it's important to, to recognize the diversity of the, the contexts that we confront in, in every part of the world. So just to give an example, if we look at what's happening in uh, South Asia, for instance, uh, South Asia uh, is a place where, for the most part, people are not deprived uh, when it comes to ele electricity access. Um, we just launched last week, launched last week, the multidimensional poverty index, the latest iteration, and we described uh, the deprivation profile. So the multi multi um, uh, dimensional poverty index uh, tries to measure poverty deprivations uh, by uh, looking at dimensions that uh, uh, complement income. So income doesn't enter into this definition of poverty. So it's not whether whether you're above or below a certain income monetary uh, threshold. Um, so South Asia, no uh, um, um, challenges or deprivations. There are challenges, but no deprivations in electricity access. So there the challenge is more how to change the system that's already in place that's still reliant to a, to a large extent uh, uh, on coal. Uh, to chart a path similar to the one that China was able to, um, uh, to, to, to do. Uh, when we go, you go to, to Africa, for instance, we, we realize that it's much more about the, the way in which you pose the question. It's much, about, much more about opportunities to leapfrog because there's, there's still a lot of deprivation when it comes to ele electricity access. There's still um, uh, hundreds of millions of people with no access to ele electricity. So that's more about how can we reimagine from the ground up systems in which we don't need to go through this um, uh, path similar to the one that China went through and South Asia will likely have to, to go through. So I think it's important to look at, at, at different contexts, but certainly what happened in China uh, is a source of um, inspiration and, and gives us all a sense of possibility that uh, changes can happen and can happen quite quickly. Yeah, if you believe that uh, most of the dramatic process of urbanization are happening in many Asia and Africa countries, uh, so uh, also including China, uh, where land use and the consumption change are driven by uh, commercial investment. Uh, those may have uh, potential to intensify the health risk of climate change. So in the future, uh, especially in the context of uh, rapid global uh, warming, uh, appropriate city planning, uh, for example, like uh, core city initiatives make uh, and also other climate action um, strategies uh, or climate change adaptation strategies can assist in reducing uh, population vulnerability uh, and also establish uh, resilience, uh, also promoting health. So adaptation measures that uh, in integrate uh, nature-based, uh, uh, also technical and social solutions that will provide uh, multiple benefits uh, for addressing the health impact of uh, climate change. Yeah, I think in the future, we also need to do more research to, uh, to uh, promote this kind of uh, strategies. Right. Hi, Dong Khan. I, I just want to share one point is, one probably useful experience from China is, uh, nowadays our government promotes a kind of health in all policies. Nowadays, uh, 
the Chinese government encouraged the use of health impact assessment for all aspects of city planning and the urban planning. I think that's a very uh, useful, I mean, to control, uh, to, 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 to coordinate the development and the health. Yes. What I'm seeing and, and what I would like to see is, uh, you know, places not doing monitoring for monitoring's sake, but in incorporating new monitoring strategies into every element of their policies to make sure that, you know, as they're doing climate action planning, as they're uh, electrifying, that they're seeing the benefits, right? And I, I don't know, you know, there's um the the latest research on the health effects of air pollution are very damning, right? These every time researchers are able to better measure air pollution, they find that the health effects are worse and more widespread, and that even acute exposures lead to heart attacks. Um, and to the point where you know the the uh, Duke climate scientist Drew Shindell has has made the case that um, a lot of you know decarbonization would pay for itself through the public health benefits. Uh, associated with reduced air pollution alone, right? Which is basically, it's a solution to the free rider problem in climate change. Um, and so I think really being clear about these benefits as well as the economic benefits, right? Of, of sort of leapfrogging also to, to the green economy. Um, to me, that's a really promising area, especially given that these monitoring solutions are low cost and hopefully a lot of the methods will transfer from place to place and, and be aligned with satellite insights as well. Um, so I think certainly from from a monitoring perspective and and from sort of the the role of these health and all policies assessments and climate planning assessments, um, I think we're we're in as strong a position as we could be uh, to have to to make progress in these areas. Great. So I'm trying to compile here some of the questions that we have coming in. So we'll transition now a little bit to questions from the audience. I think um, so. One question: There are two questions along the same line. So uh, forgive me; I'll combine the two, and I hope to get the gist of them. Uh, they they have to do with the fact that uh, certainly when you think about China and the U.S., we're very large countries with very different climates in different parts of the country, and there'll be motivations from different cities and different regions to be more in favor or less in favor of uh, climate change. In some regions, it may be more positive. And so could you comment a little bit on that? There's a comment in terms of uh, from China, I think that the earth is returning to weather similar to the Tang Dynasty. I cannot comment on that. But but that's, uh, but that's also that uh, a region like Mongolia um, or Shanghai would, be, would have effects that are quite different. The same thing would be true, obviously, for regions um, uh, like uh, Phoenix, Arizona, which is already very hot versus a region that uh, today may be cooler like Vermont. So how do we actually create, uh, obviously the problem is global and national. So how do we think about that from the lens and interests of very different constituencies like this that often uh, you know, affect our national politics and certainly our global politics? Do you have any insights about that problem? So anyone could jump in if you'd like, um, we don't have to go in order now. How do we find common cause and, and um, across regions that may have diverging interests? That is also a global question, of course. I, I think it's important that Madeline was already alluding to, to this, to, to recognize that, that inequalities are actually going to be exacerbated. It's, it's not only the averages, uh, the average temperature that's going to, to increase. And in fact, we have something ongoing with the uh, a consortium called the Climate, uh, Climate Impact Lab that is um, producing estimates of the um, impact of climate change um, on mortality that shows that it's going to be uh, exacerbated. These differences are, are going to be exacerbated when it comes to the impact on, on mortality. So um, I guess one way of, of looking for, for common cause is that in, in the end, nobody is really going to be uh, free from the impacts that they're going to manifest themselves in different ways. So, for instance, one uh, way through which this is going to play out is through migration, because there are there are going to be places um, that are just not going to be inhabitable anymore, uh, uh, and people will have to move, and they will have to move to places where um, conditions are more favorable. So, just because you currently live in a condition that that is more favorable, if you assume that you're just going to be safe um, and nothing is going to happen is not valid because one of the consequences is that people may want to move into those places <laughs> because they cannot live elsewhere. 
Uh, this is just an example of this kind of spillovers. Uh, another, another example has to do with, with conflict, violent conflict. If you look at uh, hotspots of violent conflict uh, or political instability, for instance, in the Sahel or in the Horn of Africa, uh, it's clear that uh, a lot of what's happening um, in these places has to do with the way in which people, populations interact with ecosystems. Um, ecosystems that are more and more stressed, populations that are growing very rapidly. Fertility rates in the Sahel, in a country like Niger, are now um, um, around eight. Uh, uh, so it's uh, very, very high fertility rates, um, ecosystems that are more stressed. Um, so it's not the... Um, I don't want to, to, to trivialize the, the complexity of the situation. It's a complex set of factors that lead to political instability and, and violent conflict, but certainly places that are more stressed when it comes to the impact of climate change are going to be um, more likely to, to face the contexts and the, the challenges that we currently see in, in, in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa with spillovers again or the rest of the world. So um, I think it's easy to find arguments uh, through which um, we can find uh, common cause uh, in, in realizing that's in the interest of all to address uh, climate change. Great. Yeah, any other examples that anyone else wants to bring up? Or um, if not, I'll jump to a different kind of question that also has several people asking. So another kind of question has to do with uh, looking at the energy transition problem as sort of the answer. So the idea, it goes a little bit against what Peter is just telling us in some sense, and I think many of the comments that you all made. But the question is, when we look, for example, at the fast introduction of, uh, introduction of electric vehicles, uh, another question is about nuclear energy. Um, can we hope that uh, these fast uh, introductions of new technologies or expansions of existing ones that are greener or at least don't create emissions will uh, solve the problem quickly. And do you have any caveats or any questions, uh, whether it's about the pace of the introduction or about um, co-benefits or unintended consequences that you think we should be looking at? So anyone again can jump in. Um, I think maybe uh, Professor Huang must have thought a little bit about this, but also Professor Khan. China is very interesting because the, the introduction of renewables as well as uh, EVs are very fast, faster at this moment than the United States. So what are you seeing? I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, clean energy, but uh, China, yeah, uh, in recent years has uh, uh, spent a lot to uh, investment in the like uh, clean energy, solar energy yeah, and other. And I think uh, in many cities, uh, even the bus has uh, using like uh, the batteries, and um, yeah, it will be good for the uh, lower level of uh, air pollution, and it will also bring some new opportunities for the economic uh, growth. Uh, yeah, and in in front of the climate change, I think uh, the transition to uh, clean energy, uh, zero carbon emission, it will be good. Great. Anyone else wants to comment? Of course, we're hopeful very much that these technologies will make a big difference. Um, in, in the United States, for example, the introduction of electric vehicles has been slower, so that's in itself a problem, but it's also been quite unequal. The present administration is trying, as well as here in the state and in many other states, is trying to mitigate that because it's known that people that actually drive the longest and have older cars actually tend to be poorer, and that's not the way cars have been developed. They tend to be more expensive and come in. Um, I don't know if there's anything like that in China that is becoming apparent as these introductions roll in. And also the other issues, sort of general electrification, right? So anyway, um, I'm compiling here another set of questions. If anyone else would like to jump in on that one. Yeah, go on. on Madeline, did you say? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm very excited about electrification, but I will say, so obviously, right, moving from a diesel engine, a diesel combustion engine to electrification, leads to big improvements, but you still have you still have break in tire wear, which is a non-negligible PM 2.5 exposure. And so just, you know, putting on my urban planner hat, hat, China's investments in rapid mass transit probably, you know, do more and, and more quickly 
um, to reduce some of these sources of emissions. Uh, and so really, you know, thinking about, you know, electrifying current systems, not necessarily as a silver bullet compared to really rethinking how we move people um, feels like a really important piece of this puzzle. And then, you know, um, the, the area of electrification where I am really, really excited about um, benefits for human health is um, retrofitting of buildings, right? So if you have a gas stove in, in your uh, kitchen, that's a 42% increased risk of asthma symptoms, 24% increased risk of actually being diagnosed with asthma. And, you know, that that's the same problem in developed uh, and wealthy countries as it is in places where people are using charcoal stoves. Um, and so bo in both places, you know, people are looking for electric and induction solutions. Um, and so that really, you know, if people are thinking about prioritization, green retrofits of existing buildings is one of the most exciting areas. Can I just add a couple of thoughts, Luis? Sure, sure, please. So, so one uh, is the importance of not looking at the energy transition in a way that is separated from looking at material use because the energy transition is going to increase demand for, for, for many materials and many of these materials are actually quite concentrated, the minerals that are needed and they, they are not easy to, to replace. So I think we need to look at the two together and perhaps that was what was behind the question was um, a little bit about trying to understand some of the implications for material use. Uh, and the other one is this language of solution sometimes uh, can be problematic because um, every solution may bring along unintended consequences, right? Everything that seems like a wonderful, I mean, fossil fuels are a wonderful solution to the problem of uh, relying on organic uh, means of um, producing energy, wasn't it? I mean, it was wonderful but it brought along all these unintended consequences. So whatever we come up with, uh, it, it might not even be feasible for us uh, to conceive of these unintended consequences down the road. And, and so I think this brings back the importance of what you mentioned earlier, Luis, the importance of science, of continuous exploration, learning continuously. So it's a solution now to a specific problem in a limited context, but may bring along other and intended consequences that we need to continue to constantly uh, research and, and, and try to, to explore. Exactly, that's a, that's a great point, Pedro. Thanks for reminding us of that. I think in some sense, the pace of change is so quickly that we need to be learning quickly and globally, right? So this is partly why this is a conversation, but we need to have these collaborations across our nations, our societies and, and globally. So that's very important because in some sense, Without that, we'll always be having more unintended consequences that will slow us down and may even defeat some of these um, intended solutions. So there have been a couple of questions that take us back a little bit more to the issue of, uh, of, of human health, but with a couple very specific points of focus. One is about aging, and aging is a main issue uh, in the United States and in Europe and other parts of Asia. In China, it's happening very quickly. But what we're asking here is what about aging? Can we be a little bit more specific about aging? And uh, also there's another question related to mental health and climate change and health. So would anyone like to jump in? Maybe, um, maybe Professor Khan might have something to say about that or anyone really. Uh, how does that make the problem more acute and what may be ways to think about it, particularly from that perspective? Yeah, thanks, Luis, for this very important question. Actually, as you said, aging is happening very fast in China, and uh, the old people is vulnerable population. I mean, for the ex environmental exposure, such as air pollution and climate. And uh, uh, I, I still remember one study est estimating the disease burden of air pollution, although the air quality in China decreased during the past 10 years, but due to aging, due to Chinese, we have more and more old people. The disease burden of air pollution in China actually did not change too much, even increased a little bit because of we have more and more old people. So I, 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 I quite agree that aging is a very important challenge for the sustainable development of China and for sustainable yeah, environmental this is a very important issue for China. I, I know uh, uh, maybe Conroy, you can tell us a little bit about more specifically about 
heat stress and vulnerable populations. You started to tell us a little bit, but aging seems to be particularly uh, acute, right? Certainly uh, a lot of the induced mortality in the heat waves here uh, back in Chicago, the most extreme one was concentrated on aging adults. Yes, uh, old people are particularly vulnerable to extreme heat. Uh, and uh, especially old people uh, may have like a chronic disease. For example, they uh, have like a, uh, comorbidity, uh, maybe diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, those are particularly vulnerable uh, under the heat wave days. So in China now, the aging uh, is a fast increasing uh, problem. Uh, and also uh, oh, our birth rate is already uh, slowed down. And so uh, the aging problem will be more in challenging in the future. And also now more and more people uh, and uh, more and more old people live in cities. So uh, especially, actually they don't realize uh, the, uh, their vulnerability to heat uh, when they're facing like extreme uh, heat waves and also other weather extremes. They don't know how to protect themselves, how to uh, so stay safe. Uh, yeah, so there are uh, lots of things to do for government and also for the public awareness that's great. I mean, you know, we, in, in Chicago, there's, there's been a series of measures by the city to, to start creating, and this is common in many American cities, they're starting to create cooling centers, so places where people can go to be cool. This sometimes is a library, sometimes it's another uh, official building or government building. But obviously that is a problem that's also created because people don't have adequate housing and potentially air conditioning and other forms of, or, or even better environments that are shaded. Uh, close to where they live. So there's a series of issues that kind of are compounded by this challenge and that it's really important to think about. So uh, if any of you would like to, uh, to to jump on that, there's a related question as I talk about shading that I know Madeline, uh, I heard you comment on this before, which has to do with the relationship between trees and the idea of phytoremediation and air quality. So this is a bit more specific, but trees can cut both ways as I understand. They can obviously help it with air quality, and there's some evidence for that, but they also emit oils and pollens and other particulates of their own that can also, in some cases, create issues that are, uh, that can, in some circumstances, make the problem worse, at least as narrowly defined. I also remember Pedro talking a little bit about creating ecosystems, not just the monocultures of trees. So maybe Madeline could go first, and then uh, I'll open it to the others. Yeah, trees are very complicated from an air pollution <laughs> perspective, right? Um, trees emit pollen, they emit VOCs, they can contribute to ozone. Um, and so, you know, I, I think folks get really excited about um, trees as a solution to air pollution. And trees are incredibly effective in terms of heat stress, right? Like um, creating areas, like reducing some of the uh, heat impact. And um, I see there's also a question about mental and emotional stress due to climate change. But I will say, you know, yeah. I think the the mental and emotional benefits of trees and vegetation are far from well uh, captured. And, and if we find good ways to measure and incorporate those into some of our, you know, disability adjusted life years or, or other metrics, I think we'll find that that, you know, really changes the value of, of green infrastructure and other things. Um, but yes, so uh, thinking about, I, I think, again, this is one of those places where it is very important to have clear conversations between scientists and people in a city planting trees and choosing which trees to plant and the people asking for trees um, and to make sure that you're really sort of uh, listening to the latest uh, updates from, from ecologists of what trees can survive in an urban area, thinking about the full suite of ecosystem services in the region and where you might be able to do a forest versus a tree that will die next year. Um, and I think that's just a really good opportunity for ongoing iteration improvement and, and you know, multi-directional education about people's priorities. Thank you. So speaking, so again, it requires understanding and, and follow through and not just uh, magic bullet solutions, even if it's with wonderful trees. I don't know if Pedro or Professor, Professor Khan have anything to say uh, in addition to the problem of air quality and trees. And we'll conclude in a few minutes. I would minutes. just underline like, yeah, go ahead, the please. point you made, Luis, that, I mean, it brings us back to this idea of solution. Of course, me, me, mechanistically, thinking mechanistically, more trees would be able to absorb more carbon, right? Um, but 
that's now that's not how how nature works uh, it's not about planting trees mm-hmm. really a forest is a complex ecosystem uh, that by the way involves many humans that interact with forests in many different ways sometimes indigenous peoples indigenous populations that live in in forests uh, or people that live off the forest uh, and are able to manage this this in a, a balanced way so um, I think it's less about planting trees and more about having this more comprehensive approach how, how, of how do we create ecosystems um, in which humans can also thrive. That's, that, that should be the approach. Exactly. Wise words. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Like Professor Gandhi, do you want to say anything about air quality and, and trees? Yes. Uh, more trees, more greenness, and uh, uh, I just do some do a study to to examine the modification of greenness on the health effects of air pollution, and I did find greenness. I mean, can modify to protect human population from adverse health effects of air pollution. So yeah, I think it's a good thing. It's benefit for health. Well, great. So I think we're more or less at the end of our time. I just want to say a few words and point you to the next event. So. Uh, the first thing I want to say is just really thank all the panelists for their amazing expertise and for a very open and I think engaging conversation. We ranged a lot in different parts of the world, different issues, but I think we were able to have uh, a complex and sophisticated discussion about the kind of trade-offs and problems that are involved. And I think to me that really brings the point home that as we think about sustainable development, as we think about the energy transition, as we think even of human health, as we think of our various distinct different societies, we are facing problems that are very systemic, that require you know, uh, engagement, collaboration, rigorous thinking, um, and uh, collaboration between our societies and between many different peoples in society. So, uh, so that is kind of a new way of working. And I think it's the way in which we hope to be working uh, going to the future. I think at the UN, I know Pedro very much um, uh, is, is his way of working and the way our colleagues uh, are working in international organizations. But especially I want to say that whether at Microsoft and other research institutions or at our universities, this is kind of a new culture that's emerging from these challenges of sustainable development and is one that is wonderful, but it requires that we work together and that we work rigorously and that we continue to do that in a virtuous cycle of improvement. So with that, um, I just want to thank everybody for being in the audience. Um, It's been uh, a great pleasure to have you across the world listening to us and hopefully starting to get to know us and you'll engage with, uh, with us in the future and with this team. Uh, I want to point to the next panel of the series, which will be entitled The Transformative Potential of Clean Energy Technologies. So that will be in some sense a sequel to the issues that we started with uh, today and that we started touching on. It will be on Thursday, October 27th at 7 p.m. time in Chicago and the corresponding time, 8 a.m. in China. And wherever you are, you have to figure out your, uh, your time zone. So with that, um, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you um, uh, at, all over the world and to face these interesting uh, and challenging questions and to have a feeling that we're working on this together across our societies and across our institutions. So have a great evening and thank you again. <laughs>